Hello, and thank you very much for joining us today. This is the um, second webinar in this ESCO series where we are looking at um, economic measurement issues arising with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this series considers what can be learned from novel data sources about changes in the state of the economy at this time and also focuses on methodological measurement issues specific to pandemics. Now, the lockdown in many countries has necessitated changes in the construction and interpretation of price indices. Uh, at our last webinar two weeks ago, Jonathan Athau from the ONS touched upon uh, some of these issues. And today uh, we are lucky to have with us Professor Kevin Fox from the University of New South Wales. And he's here to discuss these issues in further detail. Um, Kevin has a very impressive record of research on uh, many economic measurement related issues, uh, but particularly also on uh, price indices. Now, before we get started, uh, just a couple of practicalities. First of all, um, this seminar is being recorded and will be made available on the ESCO website in due course. Kevin will speak for about 40 minutes and we'll have a 15 to 20 minute Q&A at the end. We will also um, pause, uh, Kevin will pause um, somewhere in the middle of his presentation, I believe, uh, just for primarily for questions for clarification. Now, if you do want to ask a question, uh, please can you type this in the Q&A box? You should have that at the bottom of your screen. And can you also, if you're asking a question, um, press on the, uh, hand, raise your hand via the hand icon, basically. Uh, if I then ask you to speak, uh, you'll need to unmute your microphone and please also mention your name and affiliation before asking your question. Over to you, Kevin. Thanks very much, Rebecca. And uh, thanks to everyone at ESCO for organizing this, uh, the people behind the scenes, uh, Sarah, Mercy and John, uh, for making this possible. Um, now, some of you may be aware, um, I was actually supposed to be in London at this time until COVID-19 arose. Um, I'm glad I'm able to join you this way from uh, beautiful Sydney, Australia. Uh, and I believe we're also experiencing one of the benefits of the current situation. Um, I'm told that if I'd given the seminar at the ESCO premises, I could have expected an audience of about 15 people. I understand there's more like 150 online. Um, so uh, we, there are some technological advances from the current situation, although I'm, I'm missing um, being in London with the folks there. Okay, so um, the, I'd like to say that uh, this paper is motivated by um, my international travel disappearing and um, therefore I was concerned about disappearing goods. Unfortunately, that's not the, uh, the strict motivation. But it's a good example of how uh, goods and services uh, have been disappearing under the current conditions. So this is joint work with uh, Erwin Dewert, who unfortunately can't join us tonight, um, or tonight in Sydney. It's uh, 3 a.m. in uh, Vancouver. Um, so he's not joining us. Uh, so I'll try and struggle on in his absence. So this paper has uh, just come out as an NBR working paper, and I believe the slides are going to be put on the um, on the ESCO website, and there's a, a link to the paper there if you're interested in reading all 83 pages of it. Okay, so um, yes, as, as I said, um, the paper's about 83 pages long. There's more than 100 equations in there. It's a long and technical paper. Uh, so what I'm going to try and do in this presentation is just try and entice you to um, read, uh, to delve into that paper, to dive in there and, and get a um, better understanding of the issues. Uh, so this presentation doesn't try and take you through all the uh, ins and outs of things. Um, it's just really trying to uh, explain the basics and the hope that you will follow up and, and read the full paper. So the issue that we're facing now is that there are these millions of, of goods and services which are unavailable. It's an unprecedented situation. Uh, so we really haven't developed uh, methods to deal with it. Uh, so the advice 
seems to default to the standard treatment of non-available products. And we've always had products that have uh, disappeared and there have been ways of dealing with that. We've never seen anything on this scale. The expenditure patterns by consumers have clearly changed uh, quite dramatically. Uh, evidence is emerging. Uh, but statistical agency practice for constructing a consumer price index is to use the expenditure weights from the previous period. So there's a question about whether those weights are likely to be relevant for the, uh, the lockdown conditions or more generally pandemic conditions. So unless we get clear answers on um, what's going on and how we should be treating things, we're currently running the risk that the public and policymakers will lose confidence in key economic statistics. Uh, now, some of you are probably aware from reading the popular media, um, for example, Martin Wolf and the Financial Times saying things like, you know, currently inflation doesn't really mean much. So it's, there's, there is already a view that uh, measurement is a problem and therefore the key economic statistics that policymakers, policymakers would look to have been compromised. So it's worthwhile thinking are very hard about what's um, being done and what could be done. Okay, so uh, of course this crisis hasn't gone unnoticed. Um, so there is advice to national statistical officers, um, and I'm gonna use the, the terminology national statistical officers rather than national statistical institutes, which I understand is more common in the UK, but I'll, I'll use NSOs. So, um, but it's the same meaning. Uh, so Eurostat has been advising its member countries um, to keep their harmonized index of consumer price index weights here. They want them to be remain stable. Okay, so no big changes in the weights. Um, it's got to compile basically everything as before, the full structure of the um, classification uh, that goes into the this consumer price index. And there should be a minimization of the number of imputed prices. Okay, so this is a, how to deal with um, prices when they're missing. Okay, so this implicitly means if, if at all possible, statistical officers should go out and try and find alternative sources of prices. It's only sort of last resort, you'd look at imputing prices. Um, now what happens for the imputation, um, that can be a bit unclear. You can either uh, carry forward the previous period's prices or perhaps inflation adjust those prices or inflation adjusted carry forward prices. But this is you know, basically the standard way of dealing with disappearing goods. It's just being done on a much larger scale and perhaps there's more of an imperative to look for alternative data sources because of that. Okay, so um, it's you know, key to note this issue here as well, that the weights um, reflect household consumption expenditure patterns of the previous year. All right, so uh, the uh, United Nations advice is very similar, but it makes a bit of a case that, um, about why you want to carry on pretty much as normal because you want the indices after the, um, the lockdown period to be consistent with the pre-lockdown indices. The IMF advice is consistent with the Eurostat and the UN, uh, but it's more explicit about one thing, and it rules out the simple carry forward uh, imputation for the missing prices. So you don't just take the last period's price, but um, you should inflation adjust, uh, or somehow adjust those prices for uh, inflation at some level. Okay, so uh, constant uh, expenditure shares. So this is a consequence of using a fixed basket index that uh, national statistical officers use in constructing the CPI. Um, so have expenditure patterns been constant uh, consistent with that assumption? 
Well, evidence is emerging from, in this case, uh, credit card expenditure data from Spain, that expenditure patterns have been anything but constant. And you see this massive increase in share here for food um, and uh, a, a very large decrease in a lot of items such as this one here, which is um, fashion. So I guess people staying at home, locked down, they're not too worried about uh, shopping for fashion items. So expenditure shares have fallen dramatically. Using this uh, fixed basket methodology, um, consumer expenditure shares from a previous period to work out consumer price index, you'll be missing those changes. So that seems like a significant problem. So that's for Spain. Uh, this is for the US, some work done by the US Bureau of Economic Analysis. And um, they're, they're showing some things here like food service and drinking places is a dramatic fall. Um, accommodations and gas stations, they're all kind of going down. But some items could also be going up and that's food and, and beverage there. So you, you kind of see this big increase in expenditure uh, as people are stocking up after the, in fact, they start stocking up prior to the declaration of the pandemic. Okay, so um, yeah, there's, there's some significant changes going on in expenditure patterns, and this is a problem for many countries' uh, CPIs. Okay, so just to give the conclusions up front, I mean, what do we find after working through 83 pages? Um, so in the short run, collect whatever prices are available, supplement those from scanner data and web scrape prices. For prices which are still missing, using inflation adjusted carry forward prices. So this is in fact consistent with the advice from the international agencies. Uh, it's not our preferred option, but we acknowledge that in the short run, that's probably the best that can be done. But at the same time, um, we should try and put in place um, a method of getting current expenditure weights, right? Getting these current expenditure weights uh, for the consumption basket. Uh, so that would require either a continuous consumer expenditure survey or exploiting alternative sources of data such as credit card companies, uh, home scan data, et cetera. And I know that some NSOs have already been proactive in trying to get uh, information from the banks. Uh, for example, I know that the, uh, the head of the Australian Bureau of Statistics has written to the major banks asking them for their credit card information. Okay, and the third thing is we think there should be a, a new analytical CPI that could be produced and um, that, that would be revisable. In many countries, uh, it's the case that uh, the CPI can't be revised for legal reasons. Uh, John Aston actually tells me that under uh, European law, the uh, harmonized index of consumer prices can be revised, um, but uh, most countries do not have that capability. So in the meantime, um, at least an analytical series should be developed so that we can get a better idea of what's going on and that can be updated rather than locking in um, an inflation index and a unique inflation index and that doesn't change ever in history. That would cause a lot of problems for a lot of modelers in many years to come. Okay, so uh, that, those are the basic conclusions. Um, if, so if people have had enough already, that's uh, you've basically got the punchlines there. But here are the issues more broadly that are addressed in the paper. So we look at the measurement of real consumption, a measurement of, of the consumer price index. We go through various advantages and disadvantages of practical approaches that NSOs are likely to implement. Okay, and we, we also, you know, I'm going to emphasize a bit here the, the way we think about things from economic theory, but the paper is really, uh, we, we do try and think about this from a practical point of view. 
So we're not just trying to write theory for theory's sake. Uh, so we do try and take into account different levels of data constraints that NSOs may face. We also consider construction of elementary indexes. Um, so when you don't have uh, expenditure share weights and you look at this issue of what to do when you have a lack of matching product prices. And there's a range of other um, practical measurement problems that we uh, look at. Okay, so uh, just the key findings. Um, so using carry forward prices, either unadjusted or adjusted for inflation, um, they'll lead to an overstatement of real consumption and an understatement of changes in consumer inflation. Okay. Uh, fixed basket indexes, such as the low index that's used in most countries. So for those of you who are not familiar with the low index, it's like a Le Spears index, uh, but doesn't necessarily use the weights from either of the periods currently being uh, compared. So it could be from a, an independent year, um, uh, several years before the current comparison periods. Okay, so those low indexes uh, that are and used in most countries, they're inadequate when there are dramatic changes in consumer expenditure. Uh, and we need new expenditure weights for the lockdown period. And then there's an issue about what happens at the end of the lockdown period and how you do that linking up. Because if you, you, you do follow our advice and get new expenditure weights for the lockdown period, those weights would be inappropriate when things go back to normal. And so our conclusion is that the pre-lockdown weights are probably more relevant um, for doing the comparison. And uh, so you, you, you do, you link things up by doing the pre and post connection directly rather than um, using the, the weights from the lockdown period. And again, just emphasizing that a revisable CPI of some sort is needed. Okay, so before I get into that, I will just say that, uh, emphasize that uh, I, I am aware that NSOs are making progress on these issues. Um, the ONS has published some uh, experimental indexes, for example, uh, the BLS uh, already published different uh, CPI series, uh, including using a superlative index, uh, which is chained. Um, and so they're, they're in pretty good shape and they, they've had a, um, a rolling consumer expenditure survey as well. The Australian Bureau of Statistics from 2017, they've been using a lot of scanner data in the CPI. Uh, I think it's, I may be biased because the methodology that they're using, uh, that, that is multilateral index numbers with scanner data that came out of collaborative research uh, between the ABS and my university. Um, and uh, so, so I think you know they're in pretty good shape because they're already using a lot of scanner data, and the CPI about um, twenty percent by expenditure of the Australian CPI. Um, so they've got a lot of information from that about changing expenditure patterns. Um, so. Uh, we'll, one other thing the Australian Bureau of Statistics has been very proactive in doing is cutting down on field collections. So they haven't got this problem of uh, having to suddenly switch from um, sending people out to stores, for example, uh, and then collecting online. They've already moved to a large extent to price collections online or by phone. So there are some very, you know, statistical agencies are either better prepared than others or um, have been making more, uh, some rapid steps to um, deal with the situation. And um, I, I want to acknowledge that. When we wrote this paper, uh, it was more than a month ago, the first drafts, and um, since then there has been a lot of progress in, in thinking about uh, how to, to deal with this and some experimental indexes are indeed being produced. Okay, so uh, how to think about these missing prices. So that's the first issue that I'm, uh, and one I'm gonna spend a bit of time on because uh, it's quite important to how we position our paper. 
So you've got these zero quantities. How should we think about the prices? Are they zero as well? Or should those missing prices be modeled as being those of the previous period? So that's what carry forward prices are. They're the result of a particular model. Um, or should we use the previous period uh, prices but adjust those by some modeling decision, say as an, an adjustment for the inflation of some other goods, some other set of goods or general inflation. And those would be inflation adjusted carry forward prices. So we could make some modeling decisions like that and that is uh, in line with what uh, the international agencies are suggesting and what we end up suggesting in the short run as well. So how do, uh, would we think about this as um, economists? Well, we'd think about a um, simple supply and demand uh, diagram. And I don't want to offend any trade economists out there, but this is a very simple example that I've cooked up, which is, this is not in the paper. It's just um, something I've constructed to try and explain basically how we think about things. So think about this as a, an example of either a, a large country or there's just one foreign supplier and there's one customer and that's the, the domestic purchaser in our country. Okay, so there's some um, price at which the market clears, that's P0 and at P0, uh, Q0 is, is traded, it's transacted. Okay, so simple supply and demand diagram there. Uh, notice we've got this, this price up here, um, which I'll put a star on, and that's the price at which demand is equal to zero. Okay, so if the price goes up that high, then the consumer is not going to buy any of the good. So let's think about a uh, quota being imposed on this imported good. Okay, so uh, now the supply curve kind of goes up here and then zips up vertically there. And we're at a new high price here where the uh, supply and demand curves intersect and we're now at a higher price. Okay, so the price has gone up there. And there's been a loss of consumer welfare. Um, consumer surplus has gone down, it was that big triangle there, and it's now just a, a little triangle there. Okay. Now we can keep on moving that supply curve to the left and say, well, supply keeps on being reduced, the government wants a um, smaller and smaller quota. Well, that's kind of what we've got in a, a lockdown. So the uh, under a lockdown, um, the quota is set equal to zero. Right? Now notice I've dropped the foreign and domestic thing here, this supply and demand. So that now where are the supply and demand curves intersecting? Well, they're intersecting at this point here on the y-axis. Okay, so that's the reservation price. That's the price at which the consumer will not demand any of the product. And there's a loss of welfare and you see that the consumer surplus is now zero. Okay, so, so that's the basic idea of a, um, of a reservation price and how we're going to think about things. Um, now, what if we didn't take that approach to thinking about things? What if we just say, well, we, we want to, there's some price, it's probably not P0, but it's some other price, and we do um, some modeling of that price uh, and we uh, say we use inflation uh, adjusted carry forward prices well you know we could be down here depending on what set of goods we use um, to work out the inflation the appropriate inflation rate or we could be here it could be here it could be here well there's nothing really to uh, guide us at least in this diagram to choose from these prices um, where at least here we, we know something about that. It's where the supply and demand curves intersect and we've got a nice interpretation for that is because that we know that's the price at which the consumer demands zero. Okay, so let me just pause there for a second and see if there are any questions that I can answer. So I think there's a, a um, 
We have a couple of questions that have come in. Can I just remind you, if, if you do want to ask a question, please uh, type it in the Q&A box and also press the, uh, the hand icon. Um, we have a question from Clement Yellow. Clement, would you like to speak? Clement, you need to, you'll need to unmute your microphone. Okay. Um, let's go to uh, Sheila Page. Sheila Page has a, a question. Sheila, would you like to speak? Sheila, you'll need to unmute your microphone. Is this working? Great. We can hear you, Sheila. Okay. I, it was just uh, to specify the uh, problem of lockdown, pre-lockdown, lockdown and post-lockdown not being uh, fixed, simple periods. The, so the, the idea of using pre-lockdown uh, shares in post-lockdown doesn't quite have a meaning if post-lockdown is going to be a long period of semi-lockdown, semi-adjustments. How are you going to uh, deal with that? Well, thank you, Sheila. That's a great question. Um, fortunately, as a, someone who's just working on the theory, I, I don't have to deal with it myself just now. Uh, so at this stage, we're just trying to conceptualize um, how it should be done. There will, I mean, you, you're quite right. There's no sort of, um, date when everything will just snap back to normal. Um, and, and so this is another reason for having revisable indexes. It's another reason for trying to work out a, um, a Fisher index. Uh, okay. And, uh, and we, then we can get a better job you know, and, and the chain index and, you know, try and uh, update things that way gradually. Uh, but at some point we may realize that particularly in countries like Australia and New Zealand, which use a quarterly CPI, we, we may be able to say, well, this quarter is just nothing like the previous quarter. Um, and, and we want to uh, compare it with the, the pre-lockdown quarter. So it's going to depend on the country. It's going to depend on the circumstances. Um, I don't think there's any clear answer that it, it's certainly a problem for national statistical officers that they should be thinking about. But you could be losing six months to a year's worth of normal indices. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, nothing's really normal at the moment, um, and so it, it would be, uh, you know, as I tried to explain at the start. Uh, if we just sort of carried on as if things were normal, then it, it risks uh, policymakers and the public losing confidence in those indices. And that's what we're already seeing by comments, say, in the media um, and blogs I've been reading today. Uh, people basically saying, well, there's no point in even looking at the CPI at the moment. Thank you. So, I, Th thank you very much, Sheila. Um, uh, Clement, I think we your microphone is, is is working now. Would you like to pose a question? Clement Yellow. Okay, I think we'll move to um, Martin Wheel. Hi, Martin. It's okay. Okay, one question, please. In this analysis, are you assuming that the pattern of demand is unchanged? Because that seems to me rather unlikely. If you take the example of, say, drinks in pubs, though before the pubs were closed, they were almost empty. Yeah. Well, you're quite right, Martin. When uh, and that you know demand is going is becoming more relevant now uh, when we were writing this it was 
really just at the start of the uh, lockdown. And so it was very much a supply issue that um, we were seeing. But you're right, uh, as we, the lockdowns are lifted, it's really been a demand issue. And um, so that, that would be a, a better way of uh, looking at it from now on. But, uh, you know, there's, there's both of these things going on. And, and the simple little diagram, as I was just showing you there, I very much emphasize this changes in supply. But you're quite right, there are changes in demand, there are changes in preferences. Um, and, you know, I'm experiencing this myself. I, I, I think I'll be using video conferencing a lot more in the future. My preferences regarding it have changed significantly. Uh, so, you know, uh, these things um, need to be taken into account. Thank you. And I look forward to working with you on dealing with those problems, Martin. It's, uh, I'm sure yeah. we can do a lot together. Yes. Okay, um, thank you very much, Martin. Um, so I'll just uh, read out Clement's question. So Clement is asking the suggestion to um, to rely more heavily on uh, scanner data and uh, web scraped prices uh, at this time might introduce some uh, difficulties in comparison with the pre-pandemic period and whether there are any um, whether there's any advice on how, how you might handle those types of issues. Okay, well, you know, anytime you introduce new data uh, and methods into a CPI, there's going to be uh, issues around comparability. But having said that, NSOs have done a good job through history of updating data sources and methodologies without any um, great breaks in their series. Uh, and if you're looking at how that can be done, I, I recommend you have a look at what the Australian Bureau of Statistics did. Um, and any NSO looking at moving to those methods, um, it would be good if they were to speak to Jan de Haan of Statistics Netherlands, who advised the ABS on uh, their switch to using scanner data in the CPI. Um, so there are always these issues whenever you introduce new methodologies, um, now would seem like a good time because you know people are not buying what's in the CPI at the moment. And so perhaps if you introduce scanner data, people may get a, uh, more confidence in it. And um, that's because more information relevant to the current period has been used. Thank you very much. Uh, shall we just take one more question before you continue? Are you happy with that? Or sure. Okay. So um, we have a question from Bernard Goldhammer. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Kevin. Uh, Hi, Bernard. Uh, so uh, from the European Central Bank. So, so my question is basically about this uh, reservation prices and also maybe regarding what you call real consumption, because I think many, many people that just read an abstract of this think, oh, real consumption in GDP terms is actually biased, which is not the case because you're talking about a utility concept. So uh, this, this reservation prices, they depend largely on the assumed preferences or better you take CES preferences or KBF, whatever, uh, that you used to determine them and there uh, you can have very very different uh, different results so, so there's a paper by Irvin actually two years ago who, who showed that uh, there's a large uh, diversity in these results and so uh, they seem to be as arbitrary at, as what you call the inflation adjusted carry forward actually inflation adjusted carry forward is, is not really a carry forward it's more reweighting to the goods with which you uh, impute actually because uh, this price development is taken on. So uh, why do you think should an index which is based on this very strong assumptions about preferences, uh, which is also very uh, difficult to communicate to the public, restore public confidence in official statistics? Okay, so I've got some slides for you coming up, Bernard. Um, let, let me, so maybe I'll just carry on now and hopefully at the end I'll have addressed that. Um, 
but uh, I think we're saying exactly what we mean to say, and um, you, know, you can have different opinions about what you know, what prices you model, but when we've got to choose between them, uh, we're thinking that we want to use some economics to make that decision. Okay, so so let me. Um, go on with the presentation now because I'm going to talk more about these reservation uh, prices. So uh, so how do we think about uh, a price index from the economic approach index numbers? So it's a ratio of expenditure functions. You're only allowing prices to change going from the denominator to the numerator and utility is fixed. Okay, so you fix welfare and you just allow prices to change. Okay, so it's how much you have to, you know, it's looking at these price changes for a fixed um, utility level. So consumers must have preferences over the same set of products in both periods being compared. Um, so if, if the prices are missing, that's a, a problem from the economic approach index numbers. So back in 1940, Hicks proposed um, this idea of reservation prices. And it's not that the good um, wasn't available. It was his idea uh, when the new good appears, it wasn't that it wasn't available the previous period. It's the prices were so high that it had driven demand to zero. Okay, so if you can use those reservation prices, then uh, it has some benefits and you, you sort of catch this um, big decline in prices uh, that you get when new products appear in the market. And often that's missed by national statistical officers um, if you don't sort of renew your basket quickly enough. Okay, so we, we adapt uh, this um, methodology to the case of disappearing products and uh, we use that and um, just to emphasize about you know, the welfare aspects of, of things here, which we're going to talk about um, the theoretical as, uh, aspects of this. So we kind of think that a lockdown is kind of like being sent to jail. You're deprived of products and you're confined to a particular space. And to avoid jail, people are obviously prepared to uh, spend a lot of money expensive lawyer fees, et cetera. And that's a clear, pretty clear indication that such confinement and deprivation um, of products uh, is welfare decreasing. So uh, to capture those declines in welfare, you actually need prices for unavailable products much higher than the corresponding product uh, prices in the previous period. And in that sense, reservation prices are the market clearing prices. So it's, it's like the, the welfare has decreased and a way to think about that is the prices have gone up so much that it's, um, it's driven your demand to zero. So you've been deprived of those prices. So they're kind of going concept. Okay, and the, the, uh, the reservation prices are the, the market clearing prices that give you the, the result. So we, we to understand that we've really got to look on the um, uh, on the other side of the uh, the picture here, and that's the quantity index side. Okay, so the the price index was this ratio of exp uh, expenditure functions, utility held constant, only prices changing. The quantity index, you've got two expenditure functions, but you hold prices constant at some periods prices, and you only allow utility to change. Okay, so uh, a theoretical. Uh, quantity index from the economic approach to index numbers is actually a, a measure of welfare change. Uh, now, in, in ratio terms, you want value change to equal price change times quantity change for a fall in welfare when you an increase in the corresponding price index. So, you know, we've got, say, a quantity index here, we've got a price index here. So, if, if we know that welfare is going down, then prices must be going up for the, the quality to hold. So uh, inflation adjusted carry forward prices will not give a, this big enough um, increase in prices to catch the decline in welfare that's caused by a lockdown. 
And uh, so, you know, we need reservation price lockdown period to be much higher than the carry forward prices. So uh, here, here's my slide for Bernhard and, and others perhaps who are interested in this. So um, do reservation prices matter for an inflation targeting central bank, for example? What about a cost of goods index? Isn't that uh, good enough? So you don't need to target a cost of living index, uh, which is based on economic theory and leads to a, a naturally to a case for reservation prices. Well, uh, one possible response to this is to say that when you when national statistical offices construct a price index, they quality adjust right, implicitly or explicitly. And this quality adjustment could just be for things like pack size or package size, but it's still quality adjustment. Okay, so when those indexes are used to deflate a value change index, the quality, where does the quality go? Well, it goes into the quantity index, the results from that division, right? value change divided by price change. It's quantity change and that quantity index is going to have quality encompassed in it. It has to because it's in value, it's been taken out of prices and so you've put it in the quantity index. So what would, what that quality adjustment does is it's basically constructing a, a, a constant utility price index because you're putting the welfare change into the quantity index by quality adjusting. Okay, so as the CPI in every country incorporates some time kind of quality change uh, or quality adjustment, we're already in the situation where the price index is measuring changes in the cost of living, okay? constant utility price index. So normally we assume that the cost of goods index is a reasonably good approximation to the cost of living index, but that's unlikely to be true at the moment with uh, what's going on. So uh, the reservation price is exactly capturing the, the demand supply pressures that central banks are interested in as I tried to show on my little diagram earlier, uh, with supply and demand diagram earlier. And so any lower price in the reservation price means that the, the market's not clearing there's excess uh, demand in that little diagram I showed earlier. So we can we can revisit that later if you like, but um, but I think you know the argument that well, you know, we're only interested in the cost of goods index, uh, you know, the, the ship's kind of sailed on that because if you're doing quality adjustment, you're already in. Um, the situation where you're, you, you've got a, a cost of living index, or at least approximation to that. Okay, so uh, let's go crazy on all this theory. Um, now, we, we actually don't emphasize this in the paper. Uh, you know, we start the paper by saying, well, we're going to measure these biases in Lespierre's Parsh and low indexes relative to a Fisher index. And it's only in Appendix B we really get into this, uh, the economic theory approach. But this little diagram here is perhaps helpful in understanding what's going on. I'm going to try and quickly go through it. Um, so we have two indifference curves here, um, one representing utility in period zero and one in period one. And we, we're used to seeing these things usually moving outwards. But as we noted in the case of a um, pandemic, we probably have um, utility falling. So we're going, uh, so utility in period one is lower than that in period zero. Okay, on the axes here, we've got little q, which is a good which is available in both periods. And on the x axis here, we've got uh, capital Q, and that's only available uh, in the first period. So that disappears uh, when the lockdown comes. Okay, so what happens in period zero with the way, we, uh, way we've set things up here um, is that we have um, a budget line there. We've got um, the slope of that line determined by the relative prices between the two goods and we're consuming a little Q0 and capital Q0. Okay, and if we were to take the level of utility here and put all in terms of uh, just the continuing good, little trick here, we can just sort of say, well, 
that level of utility can be represented by that point if it's all all that utility is turned into uh, continuing good terms okay just store that away for a minute okay and uh period one we've got a similar thing here the um except that's the the point we're at because we don't have any consumption of um, this Q, even though we've got preferences over it, we're going to end up at this point here. So we're going to end up comparing uh, this point and this point. And the way we've set it up is with homothetic preferences. And this is what you get up here with uh, an Allen, the theoretical Allen uh, quantity index. It's just the uh, the ratio of those quantities, in this case, it's Q1 divided by Q0 star. Uh, and it's, we notice the quantity index is going down and utility is going down. Okay, and that's represented here. Uh, so the numerator is the short uh, distance and the denominator is the big distance. Okay. So what about Lespierre's quantity index? What happens there? Uh, well, we've got to use period zero prices to evaluate the two uh, consumption bundles in the period. So we noted that we're at this point here in period zero, but we're at this point here in period one. Okay, so here's the formula here, but you can just look on the, uh, along here and we see that it's, it's this gap here, which is uh, the quantity index is measured by the Lespierre's index. So the fall is a lot smaller for the Lespierre's index than the uh, theoretically correct Allen index. Okay, so it's um, it's overstating uh, growth. So the fall is is understated. If we now we get to this idea of reservation prices. So here, and notice it's only used for the Parsh index. So here we're just saying that well. If we're at that point there, consuming there, what do the relative prices have to be between these two goods in order to end, for us to end up there? And that's represented by the slope of this line here, the relative prices between the two goods. So we evaluate that Q1 bundle with those prices, and then we evaluate this period zeros bundle at those prices, and we get up to that point there. So that's how we get that this big. Uh, line here and uh, that is the denominator. So you see the denominator is a lot bigger for the Parsh case than for the uh, Lespierre's case. So the end result of all that is the theoretical true quantity index is bounded from below by the empirical Parsh index and above from the empirical Lespierre's index. And we've only got uh, those reservation prices in the Parsh index notice. If we replace the reservation prices with inflation adjusted carry forward prices in a simple two good example, then the partial and the Spears indexes actually are identical, they coincide. So the true Allen real consumption growth will be overstated by both of those indexes using carry forward prices. And taking the geometric mean of the Fisher index, which we usually do to get us you know, closer to the true cost of living or the true index, uh, it won't get us in, in closer in this case because the geometric mean of two things are the same, it's the same thing. Okay, so real consumption is, is usually calculated as a value change deflated by Lespierre's price index and, and because of the relationship between the Lespierre's and Parsh, um, it means that we've got a, a Parsh quantity index. So the target index for an, an NSO in calculating real consumption is not re, uh, the Allen theoretical index. It's the Parsh quantity index. And the, the true Parsh quantity index under lockdown conditions is the one calculated with reservation prices. It's, it's this one here, this Q star P. So by using carry forward prices, we're even further away from that than um, with uh, the uh, Allen true index. So we don't have to compare these indexes with the, the Allen index. We can compare them with what should be the, the true target index for the National Statistical Office. 
Okay, so the partial index calculated with inflation adjusted carry forward prices will overstate this. And that, that's the, the partial index that'll um, you know, be, because you're usually using the spares for deflators and national accounts, that's the partial index which will go into, um, therefore, the real consumption uh, quantity and GDP. Yep, okay. Kevin, sorry, uh, you have a few more minutes. Yep. Uh, just about finished, and so th that's the basic idea. Um, you know, we, we don't really go through all the theory. We, we very much look at this as a practical problem where biases are measured relative to a, a Fisher index. Um, and I just introduced that diagram, which is buried in the paper in uh, Appendix B, just because it, um, it may help with the interpretation. We do deal with other practical problems uh, about uh, not being able to do field collections. And we also look at the stockpiling problem, um, how we should think about that, given that CPIs are mainly based on the acquisitions approach rather than the consumption approach. Uh, or we also consider goods coming in and out of scope um, as the lockdown rules change. And we looked at look at issues around uh, rent holidays for households, businesses, um, this rent forgiveness problem, and how to think about that. And uh, we highlight the the role that depreciation of properties ends up playing in that case. So that's about it. Um, so our, our research suggests the following ways forward for NSO. So collect whatever prices are available including from non-traditional sources. For missing prices, use inflation-adjusted carry-forward prices, even though I've kind of dumped on them. We acknowledge that um, you know, in the short run, you can't calculate these reservation prices. That's best left for uh, analysts, academics, and, and whatever, um, what have you to work out in the future, and they could possibly be incorporated into um, some of these analytical series that will hopefully be produced in the future. Uh, it's urgent to try and up, update the expenditure weights for the consumption basket. Uh, revisable index is, uh, is also very desirable. And uh, it's important to explain to the public and policymakers that the usual measures of real consumption and inflation are compromised due to the pandemic. And this is an opportunity to ask for a big increase in budget to try and address these problems. So, we'll now take any and all further comments and questions. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, so we have a number of, of uh, questions coming through. Um, just to pick up on where we left off uh, uh, with the last question, um, we have we have a question from Jens Meerhoff. Uh, I don't know if if, um, if you are there and able to unmute. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you, Kevin, for for your excellent talk. So, um, uh, quickly on the reservation prices, I think uh, it's fair to say that we can agree to disagree on on the use, even from a central banking perspective. And I will leave it there. So, uh, two quick ones. Um, first one, you brushed over the stockpiling issue, and I was wondering that if, if even for a coli, a consumption is what matters. Aren't weights for some items such as toilet paper maybe not too far off from where they should be? Uh, that's one. And the, the second one I would have is um, so, how do your findings translate into the current CPI practice in uh, OS globally? So, basically, everybody is having fixed weights only and they do lower indices, and that will not change anytime soon. So, aren't the real issues with the imputation methods used, particularly for seasonal items? and the rollbacks once uh, the whole crisis is over. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, um, Jens. Um, okay, so, so as I said, if you, you know, you're uncomfortable with the reservation prices, you can leave that to um, uh, others to, to think about. But um, really, we think that, you know, you, you can't, have these things halfway, right? I mean, quality adjustment means you're already in the world of, of 
cost of living indexes. And there are implications from that that, that follow. And one of those is the appropriateness of, of reservation prices. Um, you know, I, I did just skip over acquisitions approach rather than consumption approach, mainly because we, we don't think that NSOs are going to uh, suddenly switch to consumption approach, even though it could be argued that it's more um, appropriate. Um, we, we don't see that really being something that's going to, to happen, but it, it could be, um, as you say, more appropriate. Um, I think, yeah, what's happening internationally at the moment, uh, yes, there's, there's issues around uh, carry forward. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, things like assuming that uh, previous seasonal patterns exist even when everyone knows the good is not being transacted. You know, that, that's really a hard sell. I, I don't really, um, I, don't, I don't get that. I, I, uh, so I'd, I would be very skeptical about assuming that previous year's seasonal patterns should be um, applied. But these are the, you know, um, yeah, so we, we think this simple uh, inflation just and carry forward prices is, is probably a, a, a better way to go there. Um, but, but these are issues that I know that a lot of people are interested in and working on at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Paul Conine, are you, are you able to unmute your microphone? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Ah. Thanks for your feedback, Paul. So. Thank, uh, thanks, Kevin, for the presentation. Uh, as you say, we have already had some exchanges uh, on your paper, which I think is very important, and it's very important to think about what the ideal target should be for uh, for this for in this kind of uh, very exceptional period. And and uh, by the way, for those that don't know me, I'm, I'm uh, I work at the price statistics in, in Eurostat. Um, and uh, we have been indeed very, very, uh, of course, busy with this uh, with this crisis, and uh, it poses uh, certainly severe challenges. And we're entirely in line with your with your uh, discussion on the weights issue, which is of course very important. Uh, but as you as you know already, we are not. Uh, as uh, Bernard and Jens also commented on the issue of reservation prices, there we have some differences. We believe that is. Um, uh, no, you you say it's it's uh, for currently we can uh, use inflation adjusted carry forward, but you keep saying that there is still ideally it should be a reservation price, and that by you you make conclusions on on bias on the basis of the reservation price, which I believe are are, are a bit uh, strong, uh, and uh, also in this case indeed of the current market um, or non-market we should say there is no market for many many things. This, this 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 model of reservation prices seems to fail to me. Um, I believe that you you want to use the economics in this, but the economics is 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 far away at the moment in the certain markets, and uh, th there is no market clearing as such, as you as you are referring to in my in my view at least. And uh, I think maybe this is something that uh, is a general point that. Uh, you shouldn't forget this. This crisis is not like others. This is not like the the, the, the crisis from ten years ago. It was induced by economic things, economic problems, and this is a government-induced crisis. Uh, there is no economics behind the crisis as such. So I believe that has that has some implications here. But uh, uh, well, just wanted to make the point. Thank you. Yeah. No. Oh, great. Thanks, uh, Paul. Um, so, so first around bias, uh, you know, whenever we talk about bias, we've got to have bias relative to something. And what should that something be? Now, you know, in, in the body of the paper, we emphasize that um, it's the Fisher index. Uh, that That's uh, the ideal that we're aiming for. And it's kind of the this idea that, you know, the, the spheres and Parsh are two extremes with the different um, uh, weights and so uh, you, you want to take the geometric mean but you know of course underlying that is this idea why is that a good idea um, and that is because the the Fisher index has some nice properties 
including from the economic approach index numbers. Um, so, uh, you know, and then of course, reservation prices come out of uh, this idea of economic way of thinking about things. Um, so that's why we're thinking about this as something we can understand, uh, this, this approach is something we can understand as what should be theoretically correct. And then you look at the practice and see whether there's a deviation from that. Otherwise, you know, bias really has um, no meaning. Um, so that's why we're, we're looking at this approach. And the idea of there being no market, well, you know, I put back this slide here, you know, you think if the supply curve keeps on moving over this way, um, you know, let's say you get really, really close here, there's, you say, well, there's a, there's a market there in an Epsilon neighborhood of this P0 star. Um, you know, it, it's not just, I, I, you know, if you're uncomfortable about thinking about an extreme lockdown case, think about a supply curve which is vertical, very close to the y-axis, um, where, you know, you, there is still an intersection of supply and demand, and that's at a very high price. So, um, yeah, I, I just, you know, think about this going in the limit towards the spike of moving towards the, the y-axis. That's how I'd think about it. Any other questions? Should we uh, take a question from Cam Yu? Oh, can you hear me? Hi, Cam. Oh, many Hi. years. How are you doing? <laughs> Hi, Kevin. How are you? <laughs> Good um, um, my, my question is, uh, in the calculation of the cost of living index, the economic theory, we assume that the only the budget constraint, but this is not a budget constraint. Um, so it, in, in technical language, the, the budget hyperplane is not a hyperplane anymore. So I think the link between the superlative index and the index formulas breaks down here. So I, I think it's, it's difficult to, to interpret the index formula with the uh, so-called utility function or expenditure function behind it. So um, I wonder what your opinion is on this. Um, I, I, I need to understand more about why you saw that as the case, Cam. So, um, Perhaps we could take that offline and uh, sure. Okay, you could you could send me some equations. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, Thanks. I'll, okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think um, we we have several more questions that people can follow up um, afterwards with with Kevin. Kevin, if if that's okay. Uh, great. Uh, because. It, we do need to um, we need to end the uh, session, unfortunately. Uh, so so thanks very much, Kevin. That was a fantastic uh, presentation, and also thanks everybody for for excellent questions and uh, and for your par participation. Uh, we have our next webinar in, in two weeks' time, uh, where, where Pavel Adrian from Indeed, which is a digital digital job search uh, company, We'll be talking about uh, what we can learn from online data about the labor market. Thank you very much. Thanks and thanks everyone, uh, particularly those asking questions. Um, very much enjoyed it. Thank you.